this um, this morning, if you follow me on Facebook, you'll see that, like Nick said, I went back to the 80s. <laughs> no, the 80s were good. 70s were really good, too. But the 80s were great. And some of the songs, you know, like Hillsong had Shout to the Lord and so many, you know, Maranatha had just, the music was just, just heart, so heartfelt, and it, it is today, don't get me wrong, but it brings back so many wonderful memories. You know, Keith Green and uh, Steve Green, so many other uh, great men of God and women of God. Uh, I just, I truly enjoyed this morning. I was going to sneak out and get a picture of the sunrise, but I was so busy, it came up before I got there. So, but last week, I, uh, I mentioned that it's not about a bunny but it's about a lamb and how important for us to realize that. And I w it would have been nice as a young person for my parents to drive that home to me when I was little. Don't get me wrong, I enjoyed a good Easter egg hunt. You know, nothing's like a good Easter egg hunt. But when you're the youngest of six and you're the last to go out, you know you're not going to get much. So uh, when it came to Easter egg hunts, it was just uh, it was a big letdown for me. <laughs> I'm just saying. But when I came to a realization what Resurrection Sunday was all about, it's not about bunnies. It's not about a big Easter bunny. It's so not about that. And I just want to share some interesting thoughts that the, the Lord has mentioned to me. And uh, I, I've, I have a question for you. And I've only heard this statement a few times in the last last year or two. Now, maybe people have been saying it forever. You ever get a certain statement that somebody says, and then all of a sudden it sticks? It does with me. So have you ever heard anybody say, oh, this is the best gift ever? Or this is the best meal ever? Like at Christmas, a kid gets, oh, this is the best gift. They can't get any better than this. And I've, I've heard people say, oh, this is the best meal ever. And I've just I've started to notice people using this is the best ever. And I thought, you know what? This is the best morning ever. What this represents is the best morning ever. And that's the name of my message this morning. This was the best morning ever. And so I just want to kind of throw some things at you and, you know, I know I don't look like an emotional kind of guy, you know, but I'm just curious if, if being this, you know, most of you know when I'm preaching, I'll have a squirrel moment, and I'll see a deer over there or a squirrel over here, and I have these, these moments in my walk with the Lord that he drops things in my heart and in my, my powerful ADD mind, and it bounces all over the place, and it sometimes comes together, sometimes it never does, but... I, I want to share some things with you this morning. And the very first thing, as I, I mentioned the name of this message, this was the best morning ever. I went all the way back to, um, I would say, probably 1988 or 89. Many, many years ago, there was a lady named Sandy Patty who actually sang at, I believe, one of the Bush's uh, inaugural addresses. But she's a Christian singer from many, many years ago. And, and before I knew Margie and Tim really well, um, they had close friends that liked to go to Christian concerts. And those close friends happened to be close friends with Peggy and I. So one time, some person named Margie got second row seats in the concert for this. Pardon me? She was on the ball. She should have been a travel agent, I'm just telling you. you know, she gets you to go anywhere. But it was the second row center. And, I mean, P Sandy Patty was on the, I mean, she was 10 feet away from us. And uh, other than sitting next to a person that was very spiritually cold, wasn't any of them. Somebody, another friend of theirs, I, I don't know who it was. But he's sitting there like this the whole time. And, oh, man, I'm jamming. I'm having a good time. But anyway, he, this woman sang a song that I just, it melted my heart. And she had such a beautiful voice, and her, again, her name was Sandy Patty, and she said, was it a morning like this? I don't, any of you ever hear that song? It was a morning like this. Now, if you listened to Facebook this morning, you did. But 
this is how the words go. I can't sing it at her level, so I won't. <laughs> it said, was it a morning like this? When the sun, when the sun still hid, got to say S-O-N, when the sun still hid from Jerusalem, and Mary rose from her bed to tend the Lord she thought was dead. Was it a morning like this when Mary walked down from Jerusalem and two angels stood at the tomb, bearers of the news that she would hear soon? Did the grass sing? Did the earth rejoice to feel you again? Over and over, like a trumpet underground, did the earth seem to pound? He is risen. Over and over, in a never-ending round, he is risen. Was it a morning like this when Peter and John ran from Jerusalem and, and as they raced towards the tomb beneath their feet, was there a tune? Did the grass sing? Did the earth rejoice to fill you again? Over and over like a trumpet underground, did the earth seem to pound? He is risen. Over and over again, like a trumpet underground, did the earth seem to pound? And, you know, as I, I, I heard that song, you know, what, 30 years, 40 years ago, but the neat thing is that when Dr. Wood was here and he gave his testimony, he talked about how you could hear trees and the flowers sang. They had, remember that? He said when he was in heaven, they had a sound. And, I mean, they sang. They made sounds. And then I was listening to a preacher the other day about, and you're going to, you, don't, don't write me nasty letters, just something to, to chew on. In the scriptures where Jesus, right before he went into um, Jerusalem uh, on, on Palm Sunday, remember he cursed the fig tree. Read closely at that. He sees it from afar, he answers it, and speaks to it. Could the Son of God hear nature speak? Think about it. I mean, I, I, maybe I knew it but I never saw it in the scriptures. I said, no, 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 that, that's sacrilegious. So I started looking at it all, and I found two, other, two or three other translations that specifically said that. I think the King James says he answered it. Didn't say he answered his apostles or his, his disciples. He answered it. It's like, whoa. And people say, well, it's because it hadn't got its figs yet. No, it, was, it, was, it had leaves, so it was supposed to have figs, so it wasn't producing so it was cursed at the roots. So he spoke to that. And I thought, isn't that interesting? And I, I don't know about you, but how would you feel if you were one of those disciples? And you've got to remember, it wasn't just the 12 or the 11 that was left. There were a lot of women there. In fact, guess who the first to see Jesus was? Women. I, I really, now, don't take this wrong, don't send me no nasty letters, but I think that he knew that women could spread the news faster. That's all I'm going to say. Okay? And it's happened ever since. But anyway, the, uh, the interesting thing was, I, I enjoy trying to think, now, if, if, I, if I happen to be maybe Philip or one of the other uh, disciples, what would be going through my mind? What would be going through yours? Would you feel an awe of something powerful that was happening in the heavenlies? Would you feel overwhelmed with sadness and grief? You know, they just went through you know, a week's worth of excitement and then literal hell on earth. They were there when Jesus was in the garden and he prayed, Father, take this, if, if it be your will, take it away from me. And as he prayed, he prayed with such intensity that blood drops came through his, uh, his pores of his skin. And they say that that only comes from somebody who is so emotionally spent and so, so focused on something that it actually, the, the, the uh, corpuscles or whatever is in your skin actually begin to burst. And they, they saw all that, and they saw the whipping. They saw him go through so much. So did they remember what he told them. Now, would you remember? I know about you, when I'm going through something really rough and, and really hard, I don't remember all the promises of God. How about you? Everybody goes, don't you remember the promises of God? Now, I can barely hang on to life itself when I'm going through those things. I'm just being honest with you. But then the Holy Spirit comes in, and he begins to say, remember what he said. 
Remember what he said. Remember when he died? What happened? When it came to the earth. That's why I'm, I'm bringing up the thing about the earth. But the earth is part of creation, right? Not, we're not the only part of creation. Before Adam and Eve messed things up, was there any death? There wasn't. Animals didn't eat each other. They didn't kill each other. And it's a known fact that even tigers and that, they could actually eat vegetables and it was good for them. They didn't want meat and that kind of thing. So it's very interesting that creation couldn't wait. And I'm going to give you a scripture here in a couple of moments that, that's going to tell you about that. But remember, when he died, the atmosphere, it just said it grew dark and it was in the middle of the day. And there was an earthquake. And what happened? It, it actually split the, the curtain in the, uh, in the Holy of Holies. Something that was almost impossible to happen, it happened. So there was, it wasn't just a spiritual thing. Everybody, oh, that's all spiritual. No, remember, I've told you this before. The spiritual affects the physical, whether you like it or not. And that's why I was saying, do you think that maybe some of them had this sense, this powerful urgency that something Something was going to happen. Even, you know, when something good has happened and you sense in your, in your spirit that something good, and, and you wake up and say, man, this, this is a good day. You ever have that? You just, just something, you sense it. Don't you think they sense that? Don't you think some of them sense that? Yes, they grieved and they'd, they'd seen a horrible, terrible death of Jesus. Was there that sense of urgency that Jesus was going to come back. Romans 8:19 and in the verse 27, this is where Paul the apostle speaking to the Romans, he said, "For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to frustration because of Adam and Eve, not by its own choice. It wasn't creation, it wasn't the earth's choice that Adam and Eve would fall, but the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself would be liberated from bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. Verse 22, we know the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but, our, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Now this is Paul after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so he's saying, now the earth is still waiting for that time. And then, whether you realize it or not, the day will come when this earth will be completely cleansed by fire and instantaneously be remade perfect. And one, I was reading one of Peggy's books years ago, and she had said, do you realize that the tabernacle here on earth that Moses had made was a type of what's in heaven right now? I said, what? She said, don't you realize that? That what is in heaven, he sent to earth. It's a type of. And, and so a lot of what we see, and we know that one day, after the uh, thousand year reign, Jesus is going to come down, right? And he's going, he's going to bring the new Jerusalem. And it, it's, the, the world's going to be changed. You know, we, we know about these things. There's expectancy, and that's what Paul was talking about. But he's, I just love how he says the creation, and he's not just talking about man. Maybe something inside you would remind you of everything that Jesus spoke. Do you remember your mentors in life? Those people, that, and they don't have to be spiritual, but do you remember people that made impacts on your life? Peggy and I, we were talking about this the other day, and uh, you know I wasn't a great student, I'm just saying. But she remembers the, the hardest English teachers she had. And she said, boy, this one, oh, man. But she said, you know, I learned more from that English teacher. And she told me this story, and I hope she doesn't mind me mentioning this. I think we've all been there and done that, where you really don't like what, how a person is treating you, and you, you really don't like a person, so you're sitting there, you're lipping off, and you turn around, and that person's right behind you. And so she said, well, Peggy being Peggy, she had to repent, so she went to this teacher and said, I'm really sorry I said that. And the teacher said, you don't have to like me. You just have to learn. And that, and that person was her, became one of her favorite teachers. And that's why English is like breathing to her. 
It's like struggling to breathe for me. I'm just saying. But she had mentors like that. You know, I look at Mark. I remember um, Mr. Baker was like a welding mentor for you and a mechanic. I never met anybody with such a natural, you know, at, at doing that. You know, Josh, it, when you went to Keystone Prosthetics and, and you were there watching these guys make these different braces and that, they were like mentors to you. But, but do any of you, do you remember people that meant a lot to you? Maybe it was a grandparent. Maybe it was an aunt or an uncle. Maybe it was a mother or a father that they said something that stuck in your life. Well, you've got to think about it. These disciples were with Jesus for three years. And he had said so much. I, you know, people say, well, they, they totally don't remember. They didn't understand. I believe they understood something. They had to. They had to believe because remember when, when uh, Jesus asked Peter, well, who do they say that I am? He says, well, I know that you are the son of God. And, and he said, no one told you that but the Father. So people say, well, they didn't have any kind of discernment. No, they, they had some. There was something there. So there, was, there had to be some kind of expectancy of what was next. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you think that? Wouldn't, wouldn't you feel that? So I get so excited at the resurrection week because it reminds me of how lazy I have been in my, in my walk, how, how unexcited I've been in different areas of my walk that I need to change. Because it's so important that he went to the ultimate for you and I. People say, well, I don't know about that. But you know what? Jesus is the ultimate mentor. I told many of you that my mother and father were, they were, they were moral, kind of moral people. They were okay people, but they really didn't set the perfect example of a father and a mother, what they should be. Some of you have had perfect ones, I'm sure, but it was, it, it was hard, and, and somebody said, well, how, you know, you didn't have a good father. How would you know to be a good father? And people said, well, it's not my fault if I'm a bad father. Yes, it is. If you're born again Christian, God the Father is your father. He's the one that is the best mentor ever. And if, if your mother, same situation. God has, I hope I don't get crucified for this. He, we were made, we, man and woman, were made in the likeness of God. So the feminine traits and the masculine traits came from the father. Do, I didn't hear any amens, okay. But that's true. Women just weren't, well, taken from the rib of the man and she got the leftovers. No, that's not it. Not at all. Okay, so that's, remember, women in the Bible are set apart. They are blessed. And God used them sometimes a lot more than we men. Are there things that have happened in your life that you'll never forget that changed your life? What do you call it? Um, not lines of demarcation, but uh, turning points. Something changed in your life. Someone changed you in your, you know, in your life. Um, something that triggers you. Fried chicken. I didn't get any response. I, I, honestly, I think of fried chicken, real fried chicken. I mean, in a, a you know, cast iron skillet, walking in the house, and all you can smell is fried chicken. Okay, that triggers me, but acorn squash, when I walk into the kitchen to smell that, that's a bad trigger, I'm just saying, okay? But how about other triggers in your life? Things of, expect, you know, that expectancy of, uh, like, how can I say this? When I knew that I would finally get to marry Peg, that we would be one, that was, I thought, at the time, the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And as I've grown older in the Lord, it's not even close. It's that day that I realized what he did for me. It's the day that changed my life and my character and, and the day that I buried the old man. And, and that changed me so that I would marry Peg. Does that make sense? Because if I would have stayed the old man that I was, she wouldn't have even blinked at me. I guarantee it. 
She, she had high standards. I said, well, I was an easy catch. She goes, no, you weren't. I, thought, I wonder what that means. I'm still chewing on that one a little bit. But, you know, it, it's this June 5th, it'll be 40 years we've been pa- married. It's, it's, it's exciting. 40 years. And all of our parents were divorced by 20, 30 years. But not us, because we got the ultimate parents. They are, ex- he, Jesus, God, they're our example. And the covenant that we made with each other is that covenant God the Father gave us an example. He said he'd never, never leave us nor forsake us. Do you remember that story? Once, at least once or twice a year, I tell you the story about the smell of rain. Remember that? Now, if you go to snoops.com, they'll say, well, that might not be true. They're very liberal. If you go, don't even go to Snoops anymore. It's a liberal, ugh, just bothers me. Every, anything that is fact, they say, well, it probably isn't true, or it's partially true. Well, you know what? It's, it's, a, it's a fact. And I'm, I'm going to, I'm going I'm to read to you about the, the smell of rain, but one trigger for me is the smell of rain. On a spring day, or like a hot spring day, and all of a sudden, here comes a storm. You know when the storm is coming. Am I right? Any of you, you know that, that smell? I told you that when I got off the ship for the first time after being there for a year, and we flew into Washington State, I got off the airplane in Washington State, and I smelled pine trees. I didn't smell diesel or jet fuel anymore or ship fuel. I didn't smell the nastiness of 5,000 men. I smelled pine. There's a trigger, and this is the trigger, and I really believe this, this truly happened. So I'm just, it, it's called The Smell of Rain by Nancy Larson. Uh, she said, in a small, again, I, I'm par, I'm, I dumbed it down a little, I shortened it a little bit. In a small hospital room for Di- Diana Blessing is her name, the mother. She was still groggy from surgery. That afternoon on March 10th of 1991, complications had forced Diana only 24 weeks pregnant, to undergo an emergency C-section to deliver the couple's new daughter, Dana Lou Blessing. Now, how old was um, the young lady that just had the baby when the baby was at 26 weeks old? 27 weeks old. So very young, and that baby's doing great, praise the Lord. Well, anyway, at 12 inches long and weighing weighing only 1 pound 9 ounces, they already knew she was in uh, perilously premature. Still, the doctor's soft words dropped like bombs on the family. I don't think she's going to make it, he said, as kindly as he could. There's only a 10% chance she will live through the night, and even if that she does, it's slim chance that she does make it any, fur- any further. Her future could even be a very cruel one, a very cruel one. Numb with this belief, David and Diana listened as the doctor described the devastating problems Dana would likely face if she survived. She would never walk, she would never talk, she would probably be blind, and she would certainly be prone to other uh, catastrophic conditions from cerebral palsy to complete mental retardation. On and on and on, the doctors dropped the bomb. No, was all Diana would say. She and David, with their five-year-old son Dustin, had long dreamed of the day they would have a daughter to become a family of four. Now, within a matter of hours, a dream was slipping away. Because Dana's underdeveloped nervous system was essentially raw, the lightest kiss or uh, caress only intensified her discomfort. So they couldn't even cradle the tiny baby girl against their chest to to offer any strength of, of their love. All they could do as Dana struggled alone beneath the ultraviolet light in the tangle of tubes and wires, was to pray that God would stay close to their precious little girl. There was never a moment when Dana suddenly suddenly grew stronger. It wasn't a suddenly kind of thing. But as the weeks went by, she did slowly gain an ounce of weight here and there, and an ounce of strength here and there. At last, when Dana turned two months old, her parents were able to hold her in their arms for the very first time. And two months later, though the doctors continually, continually uh, and gently but grimly warned them, her chances of surviving, much less living any kind of normal life, went next to zero. Dana went home from the hospital, just as her mother had predicted. Five years later, <laughs> I just love this part. Five years later, when Dana was a petite, 
but feisty young girl with glittering gray eyes and an unquenchable zest for life. She showed no signs whatsoever of any mental or physical impairment. Simply, she was everything the little girl can be and more. But that happy ending is far from over or the end of this story. One blistering afternoon in the summer of 1996, I think of the summer of 1996, we were preparing to move here. Remember that? 1996, we moved up here to the mountain. In 1996, near her home in Irving, Texas, Dana was sitting in her mother's lap in the bleachers of a local ballpark where her brother Dustin's baseball team was practicing. As always, Dana was chattering nonstop with her mother and several other adults sitting nearby when she suddenly fell silent. Hugging her arms across her chest, little Dana asked, Do you smell that? Smelling the air and detecting the approach of the thunderstorm, Diana's, Diana, the mom, replied, Yes, it smells like rain. Diana clo or Dana closed her eyes, the little girl did, and again said, Do you smell that? And once again, her mother replied, Yes, I think we're about to get wet. It smells like rain. Still caught in the moment, Dana shook her head, patted her thin shoulders with her small hands, and loudly announced, No, no, it smells like him. It smells like God when you lay your head on his chest. Tears blurred Diana's eyes as Dana happily hopped down to play with, her other, with the other children. Before the rains came, her daughter's words confirmed what Dana or Diana and all the members of the extended blessings family had known, at least in their hearts all along. During those long days and nights of the first two months of her life, when her nerves were too sensitive for them to touch her, God was holding Dana on his chest, and it is his loving scent that she remembers so well. So you see how the spiritual easily goes into the physical. Do you see that trigger she'll never forget? I think of the scripture that says, he knew them, he knew you and I before, we were even in our mother's womb. And some even say that babies, when they're first born, still have a memory of heaven. Who knows? Because their souls were in heaven until, boom, their little spirit you know, came into that body when that baby was conceived. Think about that. What a beautiful creator to do such a wonderful thing for you and I. So that expectancy, that, that trigger of, of expectancy on Resurrection Sunday to me is so powerful. Knowing that my Lord did everything that he did. So I want to read Luke chapter uh, 24. If you have your Bibles, uh, you're welcome to look or just listen. I'll be reading from the NIV Luke chapter 24 starting in verse 1. But it's, a, it's, it's the, one of the many stories of the of the Resurrection Sunday, but I'm going to, of course, I'm going to put my two bits in as, as I read it. Luke 24, starting in verse 1. On the first day of the week, so that's why we call it Sunday. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? Why are you looking in the tomb where dead people hang out for somebody who's living? He's not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. And, he, and he's going, yo, ladies, remember? And I guarantee the women remembered. Men would have been, huh? Honestly, we would have said, man, I, I wasn't thinking about it. I don't know. I, I think I wasn't there for that one. But the women would remember because they liked details. That's why I believe God had women there first, because they liked details. Verse 7, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners. This is what Jesus had told them, and these angels were reminding them. It must be handed over, uh, hands, over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. So there was more than eleven people there. 
It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James. Guess who that was? Mother of James. Probably Mary, his mom. Probably. And the others, when they, with them, who told them, who told this to the apostles. Verse 11. But they did not believe the women. Sorry, ladies. It's just like bred into us. We just don't always believe you right away. We're really sorry, because God tells us we need to. I'm just saying. Don't give me those looks either. <laughs> but they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to be like nonsense. <laughs> it's getting hot in here. <laughs> so Peter, however, got up, and he ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by, him, by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Now, if you read, I think it was, Timmy read John's today, I think. In John's, um, when John is telling the story, John and Peter are running to the tomb. John could run faster than Peter. He got there first, looked in, but he was a chicken. Okay, and Peter actually ran in there and looked. Okay, so th each, each gave a different account. And if you read John, it says, and the other disciple. That's because he's writing about himself. Verse 13, on the road to, uh, to Emmaus. Now that same day, now you've got to know, this is the same day, Resurrection Sunday. Two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Wouldn't you be doing that? Wouldn't you be the, man, like when we had all the, when, when COVID was here, that's all people talked about was what was going on at that moment. I'm sure that's what they talked about. Anyway, they went on to say, let's see, they were talking, verse 14, they were talking with each other about everything that had happened, verse 15. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him right away. He asked them, what are, your, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast. So they basically stopped and looked at him like, really? Verse 18, one of them named uh, Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these, these days? Now you remember, this is Passover. So Jerusalem was a busy, busy place. Things were really going crazy. But everybody in Jerusalem saw what happened to Jesus. And, he, and so Jesus said, what things, he asked. About Jesus of, Je of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Interesting. Now, in their mind, you know what redeemed Israel meant? He would be a great general and he would conquer the Romans and take back all of Israel. In the physical sense, that's what they expected. That's what they thought redemption was. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. <laughs> they went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they, were, they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Verse 24. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe. Jesus is he's tongue lashing them in a nice way. Um, how slow to believe all the prophets had spoken. Did not Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them once again what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So he went into the Old Testament, and these guys knew it because they were Jews. They knew the Old Testament. He went through and he said, remember, remember, remember? Verse 28, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going to go further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he had disappeared from their sight. Do you think it shocked them? Do you, do you think they finally believed what the women had said? Do you think that all of a sudden there's something going on here? 
Then their eyes were opened, and again they recognized him. Verse 32, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? I don't know a nice way of saying this. When you are walking in sin or when you're questioning whether you should do this or this or that, and something is burning inside of you, I guarantee it's probably the Holy Spirit telling you not to do it. A simple little, not a major sin, but a couple weeks ago, well, probably about three weeks ago, I went to the doctor, and I got charged, and I paid cash. I got a receipt. And I was, you know how my desk is extremely clean. I'm very organized. And I'm looking through all my papers. I'm going, I don't need this receipt. I always save them. I never need a receipt. And, and I could feel this burning inside of me saying, keep the receipt. Keep the receipt. And everybody goes, oh, that's just your, you know, you're a smart person. You sh should keep it. No, I'm not that smart. But I, I kept hearing, keep the receipt. I said, no. And I remember throwing it in my garbage. What did I get yesterday in the mail? You owe 35 bucks. And I looked all over for that receipt, and, and God kept saying, I told you not to throw it away. And I, I could tell you exactly where I was standing when I threw it away. Now, am I going to go to hell for disobeying God? No, of course not. But it would make life, it's going to save me 35 bucks now if I would have saved the receipt and listened to God. Well, God is too busy for these little things. No, he's not. The Holy Spirit's not too busy to tell you whether you should or shouldn't do something or to spark something in you. Remember, they said something was burning within us. Didn't we feel that? How many times have you known you shouldn't have done something, but you went ahead and did it anyway? Something inside of you. And so, did you learn from it? And God says, hey, if you learned something from this, that's great. But then he says, if you didn't, oh, you're going to walk around this mountain again? And all, if you say you don't do that, you're a liar. Because we all do it. But we need to grow and to mature in that. It doesn't matter how old you are, whether you're six years old or you're 90 years old. What matters, are you listening and obeying God? And Jesus told his apostles, his disciples, all the followers, what was going to happen. Let's, go, let's continue on here. Let's see. Forgot where I was at. Help me out. 33? They got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven, and those with them, again, there was a bunch with them, assembled together and saying, it's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. That, and he actually had appeared to Peter. Then the, two to, then, then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Remember, back to, this is my body. This is my blood. Okay, He was, he was trying to say, Redemption is here. I'm paying for it. I'm, I'm paying for it. And all of a sudden, he paid for it. He's trying to say, it's paid for. It's paid for. Verse 26, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, peace be with you. And all of you would pass out. I know I would. Oh, man, I'll come around. The, I'll just come around a little edge. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself about something else. And Peg will be standing there. And I'll just about fall down in fear. What do you think? These guys are sitting there talking about it. Suddenly, the Lord is there. They were startled. It says right in verse 37, they, they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. So he, he being God and Jesus, he said, he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do, you doubt, why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet, and while they were still, and, they, and I love this, and while they still did not believe it because, it, it because of joy and amazement, they didn't believe it because of joy and amazement. They were excited and joyful, but they were like, uh, you know, we're just hallucinating, you know, uh, maybe. And he said, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you. While I was still with you, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, 
This is what was written. The Messiah will suffer, rise from the dead, and on the third day, <clears throat> and on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Wow. Powerful? Now, as Pastor Tim said, it's, it's 50 days from the time of his resurrection until Pentecost. For 40 days, what did he do? He went around teaching them. Can you picture that? Somebody saying, uh, didn't he get hung on the cross? It says, well, let me go on. There, there's so much. Remember, uh, Paul the Apostle said that over 500 people saw him. Now think about that for a minute. More than 500 people saw him. So he ministered to at least 500 people. For that 40 days, he taught them things that, he, that they maybe couldn't, couldn't quite grasp until now. So Friday night on my opening, I mentioned what Jesus had accomplished and how important those words were. He paid our debt in full so that we would be sinless. When Jesus cried out, it is finished, righteousness was perfected, divine justice was satisfied, Blood was shed, redemption was paid, sins were forgiven, reconciliation was achieved, death was conquered, and salvation was secured. When he said it was finished, but he had to rise from the dead. But they were far from his last words. Because, oh, the last words, those aren't his last words. Just the last words while he was on the cross. And he still speaks to us today through the Holy Spirit, through dreams and visions, through the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as 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 of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the other twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters, at the same time most of whom were living, who are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Verse 7, Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, and at last, last of all he appeared to me also. This is Paul when he was Saul. Um, to one who was abnormally born, meaning he was not a standard apostle. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But the, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, that this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. Basically, he was saying, hey, you know what? I, I killed many of you, but you know the grace of God? And why, does, why do we see that in the scriptures? Because God is telling you and I that no matter how imperfect you think you are to help Jesus or to, to, to preach the gospel, you're wrong. He used murderers. He used, he used a prostitute. He used all kinds of people to get the gospel out, the good news. One of my, another one of my favorite songs, I forgot what the name of it, oh, it was from the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir, it says, and I love, I love how, how God has brought music into our lives that describes God and, and describes the Resurrection Sunday, describes so much. In fact, this morning, it, it's interesting, as I was, you all know I get up early to do my message. And I, I also, I, I have to admit it, I have Facebook on the side, and if I hear a click, ding, you know, I see who's on. I'm just, I do that. And this pastor from State Line, Oregon, comes on. And I, I said, oh, he's on. So I said, hey, Pastor Owen, how you doing? Have a great Resurrection Sunday. Now, guess what time it was at 5 o'clock in the morning back there? <laughs> two at 2 in the morning. So <laughs> I go, hey, and... He writes, oh, well, you know what you're up to, blah, blah, blah. And he kind of, he knows me a little bit, just a little. He knows that one of my best friends goes to his church. And uh, they know my best friend is Big Mike, about six foot, 
three, six foot four, probably about 350 pounds, big tough looking guy and everything. And uh, I just, you know, hey, have a, have a great day, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, well, Big Mike's been coming to church pretty regularly lately. And I'm thinking to myself, thank you, Lord. You know, you are so good. And so I sent him a couple of these songs. He goes, well, I got to get back to bed. <laughs> he goes, I just happened to get up in the middle of the night. For those of us that are older, you know what I'm talking about. And I checked my emails. So I thought, isn't it interesting how... And, and I just wrote back, you know, this must be a God wink. I don't believe in coincidences. So tell Mike I said hi. So about, let's see, in another couple hours, they're going to be having their, their service. Now think about that. God works in strange ways. Somebody needs to be encouraged. God will use you. I don't care who you are. He will use you if you will listen to him. Like I said, one of my favorite songs from the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir says, He loves to hear the wind sing as he whistles through the pines on mountain peaks. He loves to hear the raindrops as they splash on the ground in, uh, in a magic melody. He smiles in sweet approval as the waves crash to the rocks in harmony. Creation joins in unity to sing in majesty, uh, majestic symphonies. But his favorite song of all is the Song of the Redeemed. Name of the song? the redeemed. When lost sinners now made clean, lift their voices loud and sing, or loud and strong. When those purchased by his blood lift to him a song of love, nothing more he'd rather hear, nor so pleasing to his ear, as his favorite song of all. You know what I think about that? God doesn't care how you sound. He cares how you worship. He cares about your heart. And I've said this may, way many, many, too many times probably, is um, often I'll be in the, if nobody's in the truck or the van and I'm driving, I'll crank that baby up. I do feel bad for Pastor Tim if I forget to turn it down when I turn it off. I hope, hope it's not too loud sometimes. <laughs> but I just love the music and I love worship music. And I, one of my favorite songs, like this song will come on. And you know, my favorite, it says my favorite song of all. And you know, one day I was, I was listening to that song. I think I shared it on Facebook at one time. Lo and behold, this just blew me away. Um, I got a message back from my daughter-in-law's aunt. She said, oh, a couple of us used to go there. We were part of their choir. I'm like, Are you kidding me? Probably during the time that I actually, the song that I would listen to that they were singing at that choir. It's beautiful. I mean, it's, 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 they, are, they sound so great. They gotta be spirit filled. They just gotta be. From Times Square Church. I think it's Times Square Church, isn't it? It's just powerful. Anyway. And so so as I wrap this up, I just want to challenge you. Get excited in your faith of what he has done for you. Have that expectation of urgency of, wow God, you know, Jesus, if you want to visit me today, I'm okay with it. Yeah, I've done some things I shouldn't have done. Please forgive me, but I'm okay with it because I want to be so close to you. Work, not work. Open, surrender to a relationship with your Savior that will change your life forever. You have to. Another friend of mine this morning, I noticed he was on, he lives in Tennessee. I just wrote, thank you, my brother, for being there to show me and to teach me what my redemption really meant. That's all I wrote. Because that one person took the time to nicely rebuke me and, and put me on the straight and narrow. And because of him, I believe I am here today. The very first resurrection day taught us this, that life never ends and love never dies. Representing that day when we too will have a perfect body and we will be raptured up with Jesus in, that air, in the air. Sadly, it also reminds us that one day those who have rejected Christ will also receive a body that will never die, but burn in the lake of fire forever, totally separated from God. Now let me stop there for a minute because I, I heard this, um, it's not a joke, it's a story about a pastor who was at a barber shop and he was getting his hair cut, and the barber was an atheist, and he said, you know what, I, I, if there is a God, why does um, God allow people or send people to hell? 
And uh, he really couldn't answer him like he wanted to. So he gets his hair done, he's, and he goes walking out, and he sees this shabby, a homeless guy that his hair is all messed up, and he just looks terrible. And he says to the homeless man, can you come in with me for a minute? And so he walks up, and because that barber said there is no God, because any, you know, God would make sure everybody went to heaven. So he got that homeless man, and he brought him in, and he said, uh, hey, barber, guess what? Barbers don't exist. Because what are you talking about? We exist. Well, if they existed, this guy wouldn't be all hairy and all messed up and yucky. He goes, well, because he hasn't come to me. He hasn't brought himself, he has not come to me to get cleaned up. So God, want, God draws us through the Holy Spirit, but he doesn't force us. He doesn't grab that guy from the street, pushes him into the barber chair, and forces him to get his hair cut. Remember that. You've got to come to him. When are you going to come to him? Are you going to come young, middle, or late in life? Or when it's too late? Are you going to end up in the lake of fire? His resurrection day is the demonstration of God the Father's love for us. While we were yet sinners, Jesus died and rose again for our sins so that we could be reconciled back to our Creator or reconnected to Him. In a relationship that puts all earthly relationships to same to shame, have you turned your back on everything he has done for you? Have you ever asked him to be your Lord and Savior? Today's the day because it was the best morning ever. It really was. Yeah, he died on, they call it Good Friday, and it sounds like an oxymoron, but the most exciting thing is Sunday was the best ever. And it was the best morning ever because you and I have been set free if we receive him as Lord and Savior. Let's all stand. Father, I thank you and I praise you that it was and still is the best morning ever. That Redemption Day is applied to anybody who will receive, will confess with their mouth that G and receive in their heart that Jesus is Lord. Not just lip service, but receive him as Lord and Savior. The Lord that... Anybody out there that has never asked Christ to be their Lord and Savior, you know, to ask Him to forgive them of their sins, now is the day. Let this be the best morning ever for them. Just, just to say, hey God, just have a normal conversation with you. Let them just say, hey, I'm sorry for what I've done. Help me to be more like Christ. Have Christ come into my life. Something as simple as that. And Father, I thank You and I praise You that we should be excited about what redemption has done for every individual in here. And God, we know you want to use us all differently. We're not a bunch of puppets. You want, us, you want to use each one of us where we live, where we work, and where we are in our walk with you. We thank you for this moment in time. We ask that you just bless everybody on this wonderful morning, this wonderful day. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great one in the Lord.